Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Brarity. As Andrea just said, I am a comparative media studies major and game design minor. And this is my senior project, Transfixed, an exploration of transgender representation in gaming. My sponsor for this project is Jeffrey Long. So, oh, hold on. What? There we go. <laughs> so there are three components to my project. First is a literary essay in which I examined existing transgender representation in video games. And then the second is a podcast where I interviewed a series of transgender individuals working in the games industry. And the third is a tabletop role-playing game that I created that was informed by the first two parts of my project. So the beginning of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about some of the concepts and games that I discussed in my literary essay, starting with hollow protagonists. So if you don't know what a hollow protagonist is, basically it is when a uh, video game protagonist lacks um, agency and personality so that the player can imbue their own persona and identity onto that character. One of the most famous ones is probably Master Chief from Halo. He even covers his face so you can decide what he looks like physically as well as what persona you want to give him. Two games that I discuss in my literary essay that deal with the concept of hollow protagonists are Hollow Knight and Undertale. They also both have transgender protagonists. So Hollow Knight's protagonist, the knight, is genderless and uses they them pronouns and is a pretty cut and dry example of a hollow protagonist. They lack a lot of um, agency and personality in the game and it's really up to the player to make specific choices about what's happening in the game. So for instance, um, in the picture that you see, that is Zot the Mighty in the claws of a creature on the ceiling and it is up to the player to decide whether to save Zot or not. Um, and the knight doesn't really have any actual like say in the matter of whether this happens or not, or if they actually want to save Zot or not. Um, on the other hand, Undertale does some really cool subversions of the hollow protagonist trope. So um, when you start the game, it has you name a character and even pick some personality traits for them and then promptly throws that character out and introduces you to the game's actual protagonist, who is Frisk. Frisk is genderless and uses they them pronouns and Frisk inserts their agency and shows their personality in multiple ways throughout the game. One of my favorite is when you go to another character's house, Undyne, and you have to pick a drink. So yeah, it's the player who is physically picking the drink, but Frisk lets you know which choice they want you to choose by little subtitles next to each option. So say Frisk, or say you point at the soda and next to it, it'll say like, ooh, disgusting. And then you point at the tea and it says the blatantly correct choice is that is the one that Frisk wants you to choose. Frisk is better transgender representation than the knight because Frisk is a fully fleshed out character with a personality and wants and desires versus the knight who is personality-less and doesn't have um, much say in what's happening in the game. The next concept that I'm going to be talking about is othering. So othering is when minority characters are allowed in a piece of media, but they are separated from the other characters in the media. For instance, um, it's a pretty common trope when dealing with trans and non-binary characters to allow them in media, but to have them be something other than human, which separates and dehumanizes them from the other characters in the show. A uh, common, or, uh, one of the biggest examples of this in video games would be Flack from Borderlands 3. Flack is non-binary, Flack uses they them pronouns, Flack is a robot. And in being a robot, it uh, dehumanizes Flack's non-binary identity and separates them from the other characters in the game. Um, another game, Monster Prom, does a really cool subversion of the othering trope. If you don't know Monster Prom, basically you attend Monster High School and you're trying to romance one of your monster classmates to get them to go to Monster Prom with you. Um, one of the romanceable characters in the game is my girl Zoe. She's trans. I love her. She um, transitioned from Eldridge Deity to Eldridge Cutie, as she likes to call herself. And in that transition, she becomes more normalized because she becomes more like her classmates and more integrated into her community. Um, and so she, in this case, is much better transgender representation than Flack is because Flack is othered and dehumanized for their non-binary identity. So the next concept that I'm going to be discussing is queer tragedy. Queer tragedy is when um, queer characters in games, or 
Queer characters in media are allowed in media only if they suffer due to their queer identity. So um, in The Last of Us Part Two, Lev, um, oh gosh, sorry, changing rooms completely threw me off. Um, <laughs> in The Last of Us Part Two, Lev is a trans character and he is ostracized and even hunted by his community because of his transgender identity. And yes, The Last of Us Part Two is a game that deals with a lot of suffering and tragedy, but the difference is how the characters suffer in the game. So the other characters in the game suffer because of the choices that they make and the apocalyptic environment that they live in versus Lev who suffers specifically because of his transgender identity. Um, another game, Tell Me Why, on the other hand, does a cool subversion of the queer tragedy trope. So the game follower follows the protagonist, Tyler Ronan, who is a trans man, and his twin sister, Allison, as they um, uncover the mystery of the events surrounding their mother's death when they were young. At the beginning of the game, Tyler thinks that um, her death is directly related to her not accepting his transgender identity, but that is quickly tossed out the window as when Tyler and Allison go to their old childhood house, um, they find books on their mother's bedside table about supporting and raising your transgender child, meaning that she actually did love him and accept him for being transgender. And the tragedy that they faced as kids um, had to do with external forces and not his transgender identity. Of course, I couldn't be talking about trans rep and anything without dealing with dead naming and misgendering. Um, I do think that dead naming and misgendering can have a place in media as a educational tool to help understand why um, names and pronouns are so important to trans folk, but I also think it can be done badly. Um, one game that I think doesn't do a great job at it is The Last of Us Part Two. So as Lev is being um, ostracized and hunted by his community, they use his dead name as a way to antagonize him and they misgender him constantly um, throughout the game. One of the game's protagonists, Abby, is supportive of Lev and his identity and never misgenders him, never dead names him. However, Lev's inclusion in the game is really only there as like a stepping stone to make Abby look good and to develop Abby's character um, further. This is really similar to a concept called fridging, which is a uh, feminist critical tool that was named by Gail Simone, and it has to deal with um, the inclusion of female characters in media as a plot device for male characters. It comes from a specific Green Lantern comic in which Kyle Rayner comes home and finds his girlfriend dead in his refrigerator. And it's really just there to move along Kyle's story. Um, and Lev is used in a very similar way to help, or to, as a plot device to help move along Abby's story. A game that I think does uh, misgendering and denaming in a really cool teaching moment is Monster Prom. So we're gonna go back to talking about my girl Zoe. I love her. Um, she has a cult that has been following her since before her transition. And at the very beginning of the game, they dedname and misgender her, not out of any sort of malice, but merely because they don't understand why her name and her pronouns are important to her. And they have an entire subplot where they learn about Zoe's new identity and they learn about why her name and her pronouns are really important to her and in the end they use her correct name and her correct pronouns and they find ways to support her as Zoe instead of the eldritch deity they used to know. And this is such a cool teaching moment in a game and I really love the inclusion of it in Monster Prom. So I'm now gonna move on to be talking about the podcast that I created as part of this project. Um, it is a series of conversations with trans folk who work in the games industry. I got to interview five people for this project. The first three um, work creating TRPG podcasts. So they play games similar to Dungeons and Dragons. Um, some of them are dungeon masters, some of them were players, but I had some absolutely wonderful conversations about them, about how games and role playing can be used to explore identity and gender in a safe environment. The other two people that I interviewed were um, trans game designers and they incorporate a lot of queer and trans themes into their game design. So they deal with a lot of concepts of found family, 
um, queer love, acceptance, gender identity, things like that. And I really wanted to incorporate everything that I learned from them and my literary essay into the game that I created, Cryptic Conceptions. So I really wanted to use this game to create a safe space for um, folks to explore gender and identity in a fun role-playing environment. So I chose to use Avery Alder's system of belonging outside belonging. This system is um, specifically designed to help explore minority communities living outside of society. So I thought it would be perfect for this game. The original um, concept that I came up with, version 1.0, uh, had the players be a group of cryptid enthusiasts who were helping um, protect cryptids from exploitation, whether they were being exploited by the media or hunted for their various traits, things like that. But through uh, playtesting and stuff, I realized that what I'd actually created was an ally simulator because the character, the players themselves weren't playing as the cryptids, but they were playing as allies to the cryptids. And so I'm currently working on creating and playtesting version 2.0, where the players get to play as cryptids and get to work to help their own community um, from those who want to exploit them. This is one of the character roles that I made for the game. It is called The Scholar and it's focused on knowledge. I thought it would be perfect for this presentation. Um, if you look at the middle column, this is the character creation column. And the first three questions are the same on all of the character roles that I created. So what are your pronouns? What cryptid are you? And then how did you get your name? I wanted to add this question on there because names are really important in the trans community. They're directly connected to identity and they're often um, found and discovered in some weird places but they mean so much to folks so I wanted to give players the ability to explore what names mean to them and the strange places sometimes we find our names. Um, the belonging outside belonging system is a no dice no master system which means that instead of a um, game master running the game it is a purely collaborative experience so the players collaborate on creating the world and um, role playing as they go. And then instead of having players roll dice to see what happens in the game, there are three different types of moves that they can do. So there are strong moves, which is about um, showing your truth, being confident, and uplifting your community. So for example, one of the ones that I chose for the scholar is tell someone something they need to hear. And then there are regular moves, which is about um, fleshing out the world, making it feel more real. So these are things like um, asking questions, talking to townsfolk, searching for supplies and shelter, basic needs like that. And then there are weak moves, which are absolutely my favorite because they're about making your characters feel real and fallible. So they're about showing fear and weakness and allowing your community to uplift and help you. One of the ones that I chose for the scholar is admit that you don't know something because for somebody who covets knowledge, that could be a very scary prospect. Um, Thank you guys so much for listening to my presentation. I apologize for the technical difficulties. I have to give a huge shout out and thank you to my sponsor, Jeffrey Long, for helping me make this project possible, as well as Andrea Wren for all of her help this semester. I really wouldn't be graduating right now without her and I appreciate her so much. To my platonic soulmate, Izzy Horn, for having to listen to me rant about this project for over a year now. And also um, they have edited everything that I've ever written, including this project. So I truly owe my success to them. And to my wonderful friend, Justin Hammer, who is a huge game design inspiration and helps me out with cryptic conceptions. I also have to give a huge shout out to everybody who allowed me to interview them for the podcast and to all of you listening and everybody else who made this project possible. Thank you all so much. Here is my work cited and does anyone have any questions?